When is not having period a problem? Hi friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. And today we're talking about amenorrhea or absence of your period. Specifically, I want you to know when is this a problem? What do you need to look for? And who do you go for an evaluation? What do you need to have checked? When is not having a period a sign that something is wrong? I'm a fertility doctor, which means I'm a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist. This means I love the hormones. I like to consider myself one of the true hormone experts. On this channel, we talk about fertility and your body and your health. And if you want to learn more, please, please subscribe to support the channel. Let's dive in. First of all, Amenorrhea means absence of periods, not having a period. There are two different types of amenorrhea. There's primary amenorrhea and secondary amenorrhea. Truly, this video is mostly going to go over secondary amenorrhea, meaning a person who had periods no longer has them. However, I think it's important to talk about primary amenorrhea as well, just so that we know what it is. Everybody starts with eggs born inside their ovaries. From the moment that you're born, eggs are being released from that little vault inside the ovary, and they're waiting on a signal from the brain called FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, which works by stimulating one of the eggs to grow. That is called puberty, when the brain turns on and starts making FSH. When the ovary starts growing eggs and making estrogen, what we start seeing is secondary sex characteristics, such as breast development and pubic and axillary hair. After enough estrogen exposure, the body really kicks into ovulating and then we see periods. So periods don't come from estrogen alone, they come from truly ovulating that egg and having both estrogen and then progesterone and a progesterone withdrawal bleed which causes a period. This is important because the definition of primary amenorrhea is twofold. One is if you're 14 and you don't have any signs of puberty, meaning no breast, sexual hair development, or periods. Another is if you're 16 and you've had your other signs of puberty develop. You have breast and hair, but you haven't had a period yet. Another way to look at it also is if you haven't had a period by two years after those secondary sex characteristics started, you need to go get an evaluation. Now, what this video is actually talking about is secondary amenorrhea. This means having no period for six months or greater. So you could have oligomenorrhea, which means irregular periods occurring at longer intervals and skipping months every three months, but you're not amenorrheic, you're having periods. So if you're not having periods, you have amenorrhea, you need to go either to an OBGYN or an REI to try to get to the bottom of the cause. The main causes can either be obstruction, so some type of anatomical abnormality, could be number two, a disorder of the ovary, number three, a disorder of the pituitary gland, or number four, a disorder of the hypothalamus, which is part of the HPO axis. So the way I want you to think about hormones and to think about secondary amenorrhea is first remember what happens in a normal period. So super fast. You've got all those eggs in a vault, a group of them comes out at the start of each month. Each egg grows inside a follicle brain sends out follicle stimulating hormone. What that really means is the hypothalamus sends out GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, which tells the pituitary gland in the brain to send out FSH. FSH then stimulates a follicle to grow. As that follicle grows, it makes estrogen. Estrogen feeds back to the pituitary gland and to have LH secreted, which is the trigger for ovulation. After ovulation, that follicle releases the egg, reforms and makes a corpus luteum and makes progesterone. When a pregnancy implants, the HCG from the pregnancy stimulates that corpus luteum to keep making progesterone. However, if there's no pregnancy, there's nothing to rescue the corpus luteum, progesterone levels drop, and suddenly you have a period and the process starts over. That is what needs to happen to have a period every month. That sounds really complicated, and that's why we consider the period a vital sign. It is a sign of how your body is functioning, and when you don't have a period, it's a sign something is going on. First thing can be obstruction. Now, this can cause primary amenorrhea if you have a septum or a full-on blockage, or if you have an imperfect hymen, but for secondary amenorrhea, there typically needs to be some reason why things would be blocked now. So a top cause is something called Asherman syndrome. Asherman syndrome is scar tissue inside the uterus from prior uterine instrumentation. This can be caused from a DNC procedure, a medical termination, sometimes an IUD placement, or more commonly, removing a placenta in the context of a retained placenta after delivery or postpartum bleeding or hemorrhage after a delivery. You're gonna need some type of imaging inside the uterus. So this is typically gonna be the saline sonogram 
or perhaps an HSG test. So some type of test where water or dye is getting into the uterus so we can see if there is scar tissue formed. In Asherman syndrome, the brain is working fine, the ovaries are working fine, those follicles are growing, making estrogen, but because of the scar tissue, the lining can't grow and respond. So you're not getting the growth or the response to progesterone. So the hormones are working fine. People can still even get PMS symptoms. However, there's no bleed to show for it. Evaluating the brain and the ovaries, the HPO part of this axis, all comes together. Different things impact different parts of this, but the hormone evaluation is the same. You're gonna check FSH, LH, thyroid, prolactin, and estradiol, which is the form of estrogen made from the ovaries. One cause can sometimes be running out of eggs early or premature ovarian failure, also known as premature ovarian insufficiency or premature menopause. In this case, those eggs inside the vault are either very, very low or absent. In these settings, the brain is sending out all the FSH it can to try to get an egg to grow, and the ovary is not responding in a timely or predictable fashion. Classic labs would have a very high FSH and a low estradiol. Occasionally, you can have a normal FSH and a really high estradiol, and this is in that diminished ovarian reserve phase, when you're truly in the premature ovarian insufficiency or failure phase, high FSH, low estradiol. In those cases, we want to do an evaluation to try to figure out why, which can include a genetic evaluation and checking for autoimmune disease. People who are going into premature ovarian insufficiency. Because the ovaries won't work, I don't have magic fertility medications I can give to make you ovulate or to go through IVF because your brain is already sending out tons of FSH. So when these cases are close to failure but not truly, sometimes we can intervene for pregnancy. When you're truly in ovarian failure, you need to replace your hormones and you're looking at donor egg or embryo to get pregnant. We also see hypothalamic amenorrhea. So when we think of hypothalamic amenorrhea, that's where we have that hypothalamus, and it is not secreting out the right hormone, which is GnRH. This is very commonly from stress, if we use that kind of as a big header. This can be actual physical stress. This can be chronic stress from chronic illness. This can be stress from high levels of exercise, from calorie deficiency, a variety of causes. So typical causes are extreme athletes who exercise a lot, or people who are not eating, have eating disorders like anorexia, what we are seeing in those circumstances is that the brain is under such stress, it decides it can't support reproductive function, stops sending out GnRH, therefore the brain stops sending out FSH, therefore the ovaries don't see any signals to grow an egg and make no estrogen. So classic labs in this scenario include low FSH, and a low estrogen. This is traditionally referred to as hypo-hypo, meaning hypo being low, so the brain has low levels of hormones and the ovaries have low levels of hormones. This is also called FHA, or functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. In these cases, one of the top things that I see is people are trying so hard to get to a fix once they've identified this. They're trying to alleviate stressors, work out less, eat more, make sure they don't have any other chronic diseases that are mismanaged, but it can take years for your body to be out of this stress and to determine that it's a safe time. So if you're trying to get pregnant as deemed that you have hypo hypo, you often are going to need actual gonadotropins, which is FSH, the hormone from the brain, in order to get the eggs to grow. This can be really tough in circumstances of just trying to get one egg to ovulate because it's hard to find the magic dose and very often it is safest to go through IVF. So using gonadotropins like FSH, get the eggs to grow, take them out of the body and fertilize them in a lab. That way we don't carry the high risk of multiples that we see by FSH injections in these scenarios. But everybody's different, so talk to your doctor. Similarly, if you have FHA and you're not trying to get pregnant, you are also hypoestrogenic, meaning you're in a low estrogen state. Typical signs of that can be difficulty sleeping, sometimes hot flashes, headaches, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, vaginal dryness, lack of libido, and an overall sense of not feeling well. So if you have any of those and you're not having your period, please go see a doctor. We also see a brain and ovary communication problem called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. In PCOS, the easiest way to think about it in my mind is that your vault is very, very full, therefore it sends out a lot of eggs every month. The brain sends out a normal level of FSH, but the signal gets diluted amongst all of those follicles and therefore is not strong enough to get any one of them to grow. You can sometimes have normal estrogen levels and normal FSH levels, but you're not having a period. You also can tend to see sometimes high LH levels because LH is driving androgen production, such as seeing testosterone made. 
clinical symptoms are irregular or absent periods, seeing a high number of follicles on an ultrasound, and either laboratory or clinical evidence of high androgens such as testosterone. These can be acne, hair growth, hair thinning. You need two out of three of these for the diagnosis of PCOS. Those are called the Rotterdam criteria. Other things we often see is can be like central weight gain, even in thin patients, and that's because of a high association with insulin resistance. There are lifestyle management options, and sometimes that can overcome some of your PCOS symptoms, but sometimes you're going to need help to ovulate or to bring your cycle about. Unlike in hypohypo where no estrogen is being made, in PCOS you often are making some estrogen. There's just no trigger because there's no progesterone withdrawal to truly dump that cup and have a period. I always use the analogy if you can imagine that there is a cup and the faucet is just on, the cup is just drip, 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 dripping because the faucet is on drip. That's what happens with PCOS. Eventually the cup may overflow. What should happen in a normal period is a follicle grows, the faucet is on, the cup fills up, you ovulate, faucet turns off because progesterone is made, progesterone then drops and that's dumping out the cup and that's a true period. But some things in PCOS, faucets on drip, you never have an ovulation, so you never turn the faucet off and you never get the signal to dump out the cup, the cup just starts to overflow. So sometimes in PCOS, we do see these irregular bleeds that aren't actually withdrawal bleeds from progesterone. They're truly just overflow bleeds from an unstable endometrium. This is also why in PCOS, we worry about endometrial cancer. Some of those endometrial cells have been sitting at the bottom of the cup for a really long time and we start to worry that they can become abnormal and turn cancer. Therefore, you'll often see doctors talk about putting you on some type of either daily progesterone, a progesterone IUD, or cyclic progesterone to have periods every one, two, or three months. Think about that as dumping out your cup to keep you safe. You can have both hypo, hypo and PCOS, and I have this in a handful of patients, and it can be really frustrating. You get diagnosed with PCOS, you try to make some changes, but because you have underlying hypo, hypo, you truly aren't going to ovulate even in those circumstances. This is a complicated diagnosis, and so the best thing to say is that if you're not really fitting into one of these pictures or your hormones aren't making sense, just see a reproductive endocrinologist. Other things that can cause amenorrhea from the pituitary are abnormalities in your thyroid or your prolactin. So TSH is made from the pituitary gland that is thyroid stimulating hormone. TSH works to tell the thyroid gland, a little butterfly shaped gland here on the throat, to release thyroid hormone, aptly named thyroid hormone. When your body does not sense that there's enough thyroid hormone, the brain starts to send out an increase in TSH. Hi, baby. Hi, mommy. Therefore, your TSH is high when you are hypothyroid. You don't have enough thyroid hormone. The other thing that can happen is that the brain can have too much thyroid hormone. So if you have an overactive thyroid gland called hyperthyroidism and it's making tons of thyroid hormone, the brain can get overwhelmed by how much thyroid hormone it has and it sends out no TSH because it is overwhelmed, it has too much, and that's hyperthyroidism. Both of these can cause menstrual abnormalities. They are typically, when you're hyperthyroid, you're having more frequent periods and more bleeding, and when you're hypothyroid, you tend to have more irregular periods and anovulation. The other thing is prolactin. Prolactin is really fascinating. It's a hormone from the pituitary gland also that's very important in lactation. However, what we know is as your prolactin gets increased from a variety of reasons, you see a very characteristic menstrual pattern change. And then when your prolactin gets treated with medications, it reverses back to normal. So you'd go from normal periods to a short luteal phase to skipping cycles to amenorrhea. And we see that go as your prolactin increases with time. This is easy to check, it's a blood test. If you do have an elevated prolactin, you should check a brain MRI to make sure that there's not a pituitary microadenoma. These are small benign tumors in the pituitary gland that are making extra prolactin. Sometimes they can be large and called a macroadenoma. And they can actually mess up your vision. The classic is like tunnel vision. You can't see out in these brain fields. And that's because that pituitary gland, which is in the middle, is pressing on your optic chiasm. And the eyes are super crazy and they're reversed. So when it presses on the middle of that, you lose vision on the outside. You get so headaches, tunnel vision. A, no periods or irregular periods, huge warning sign to go get an evaluation. High prolactin can also be stimulated from exercising a lot, from nipple stimulation, and from certain medications, especially medications for psychiatric diseases or ADHD medication even. And so it's very important if you're found to have a high prolactin to make sure that your doctor has your entire medication or supplement list so you can know everything that potentially could be causing it but there are great medications that can drop your prolactin down in the normal range, and that often can restore your period. So if you're not having periods, the basic evaluation that you're gonna need, some type of imaging of the uterus, 
and then some hormone tests. The basic hormone tests that we like are FSH, LH, estradiol, a TSH, and a prolactin. Those are the hormones that are going to help us the most, immediately going to start to point us into one direction or the next. I hope this video helped. As always, would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. You can follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or get more information on the As a Woman podcast. Thanks, friends.